viewers, and welcome to the third instalment of Ask Cedars, the show in which I answer your questions. And I have a few questions to get stuck into, the first being from Twitter. At uh, XJWActivist1 says, Hi Lloyd, I'd like to ask your opinion on the parts of this year's convention entitled Courage Required to Proclaim the Hailstone Message and also Courage Required During the Great Reconstruction. I'd never heard this JW lingo before. What do you think it means? That's a great question and you'll be interested to know that all of the talk outlines for the forthcoming 2018 Regional Convention have been leaked. They're actually on faithleaks.org. So if you go on faithleaks.org, click on the newsroom, you'll see that one of the most recent uh, posts is about the Regional Convention. If you click through there, you should be able to find your way to a list of all the talks and included in those talks are the talks that you mention about the hailstone message and uh, the great reconstruction. So just in case you're interested, here's what it says about the hailstone message. After the destruction of Babylon the Great, we will no longer be preaching the good news of the kingdom the long-awaited end will have come. We believe that instead of good news, Jehovah's people will proclaim a hard-hitting message of judgment. This message is compared to hailstones. The symbolic hailstone plague will be unusually great. We will need courage to proclaim the hailstone message. Imagine the courage Jonah needed to proclaim Jehovah's judgment against the city of Nineveh. So basically the hailstone message is supposed to be a, a message of judgment that Jehovah's Witnesses will switch to. So rather than um, proclaiming good news, it will be a message of judgment. But this is supposed to happen after the destruction of Babylon the Great. So it's difficult to imagine the Witnesses... Um, <laughs> switching to doing this unless they interpret something as indicating that Babylon the Great is, is over, has been defeated, which they have actually done if you read the Revelation Climax book. They've said all sorts of things about, oh, well, this was when the church was defeated and it was silenced and they went through terrible pains and plagues and that kind of thing. So they've, they've been capable of interpreting fairly innocuous events in history as being more significant than they actually are in the past. So it wouldn't surprise me if they tried to pull the same stunt again. And as for the Great Reconstruction, this is actually supposed to be after Armageddon, when the world is being reconstructed. And um, in the outline it says... We do not know what sort of material things will remain after Armageddon. Presumably there'll be lots of bodies left over <laughs> after Armageddon. Um, or at least what's left after the birds have, uh, have finished. We do not know what technology will be used. We do not know how land will be apportioned. Though there is much we do not know, the following video will show us how we can prepare now. So in short, um, if you want to know... If you want a sneak preview of what will be said at the convention, all you need to do is head on over to faithleaks.org. But moving on to our next question, and JJ asks, have the Watchtower painted themselves into a corner over the blood issue, in as much as they seem to know that if they were to acquiesce and new light the position, then they would face massive lawsuits from relatives who have lost loved ones. Um, JJ, that's a good observation. I think that there is an element of that. Um, as I've said in previous videos, I think that the, the leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses are genuinely deluded on this. And to at least some degree, they seem to have convinced themselves that they speak for God. And they seem to have convinced themselves that this is the position that God wants them to stick to. 
but you have to say that once you start tinkering in medicine and what medicine people are allowed to have or not allowed to have, and then you start getting the body count as a result of um, imposing yourself in this way, you are then wedded to this uh, teaching because if you were to go back on it, you would be accountable for all of the people who died. And I think that's true with blood transfusions. Um, I actually think that the what we're going to see is that medical technology will kind of come to the rescue of Jehovah's Witnesses because quite aside from the fact that you have this large community of people who for religious reasons can't accept uh, someone else's blood, there is uh, a lot of research being done to create artificial blood because if you think about it, it would immediately relieve the need for people to donate blood and also if you have artificial blood you would be able to store it indefinitely or for long periods of time whereas real blood you it has a shelf life you have to uh, dispose of it after a certain period so there's all sorts of reasons why I believe um, science will basically come to the rescue eventually so that witnesses will stop dying or at least it will be very rare for a witness to die from refusing blood. But um, the responsible thing to do, of course, would be for Watchtower to end the teaching now uh, and, and encourage witnesses to uh, follow the advice of their doctors. But I don't believe they're going to do that for the reason you, that you have alluded to, namely that they then make themselves accountable for all the people who have died. Uh, Simon Bellant says, Hi Lloyd, what significant projects, actions, goings on and hopeful Watchtower scandals are in the pipeline for the next year, say? And what effect do you believe this can have on Watchtower? You recently tweeted along these lines saying, Impossible for Watchtower to fool anyone. Uh, thanks. So, I guess the question here is what can we, can we look forward to? I obviously don't know about what Watchtower scandals are in the works. It's up for Watchtower to generate their scandals and I'll always do my best to weigh in on that. But when it comes to this year, I think, I've, I think what you're referring to is some tweets that I've made regarding the significance of 2018 when it comes to activism and when it comes to exposure. So we are starting to see a shift, I believe, in activism, so that rather than it just being a case of the occasional media coverage in the newspapers, the occasional uh, news report, um, YouTube videos, blog websites, etc., I think that there is a, a shift going on, so that we're starting to see far more polished uh, exposure of Jehovah's Witnesses that will reach a much broader audience. And some of those initiatives I've talked about, I've talked about the documentary I'm working on, The Truth About the Truth. I've uh, spoken to Scott Homan on the channel about his XJW uh, coming out docu-series. That sort of thing, I believe, is gonna have a major impact and uh, there are other projects as well that I'm aware of, but I just can't talk about them, that lead me to conclude that 2018 will be a significant year in raising awareness and making it harder and harder for Watchtower to con people and con uh, the general public, because the general public will start to view Jehovah's Witnesses as they already view cults like Scientology. Hope that answers your question. Erato is your muse, fantastic name, says, I have a question, but it's not really pertaining to the Jehovah's Witness religion, just a curious question about your family. Seeing as Diana and her parents are Croatian and you are English, are you raising Jessica to be bilingual? Yes, and Jessica already is bilingual. She speaks both English and Croatian. Don't ask me how. <laughs> but um, 
she's just coming up to her fourth birthday and already she speaks both languages which I'm absolutely thrilled about because I think the more languages you can speak the more opportunities you will have. Now it's time to go to a voicemail. Hi Lloyd. I can't reveal my name unfortunately at this time but I would just like to thank you for the work you do as a journalist and a whistleblower um, as regards to what the Watchtower Corporation does to its members and how it weaponizes people's families. I just finished watching one of the latest videos on JW Broadcast where it shows the brothers and sisters in Malawi participating in the letter writing campaign to Putin when Jehovah's Witnesses were encouraged to write letters to various government authorities in Russia. And I found it ironic because one of the highlighted terms that they showed in a, a letter that a Malawi brother was writing was, Dear Mr. Putin, grant Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia the freedom to worship. And as I'm sure you can appreciate, this is very ironic because the Watchtower does not allow their own members the freedom to worship or not worship as they would like. And as you've highlighted in other videos, this is indeed a violation of basic human rights. So I'm wondering if you think um, it would be interesting to have um, our own letter writing campaign where ex-Jehovah's Witnesses or physically in, mentally out, current members gathered together and did our own letter writing campaign to branch offices or the governing body in the United States. And certainly for the sake of safety's sake, um, those who are physically and mentally out could send their letter to a friend who lives in another state or town and ask their friend to mail it in so that no uh, return address could be traced. It's just an idea. I'm wondering if there's anything you could do to get this ball rolling since you have a wide audience. I think it's important for those at Bethel, although I do understand that when you're that indoctrinated, it's difficult to get through that, that wall. But maybe if more and more people started writing letters, just like the witnesses thought that they could somehow reach Putin's heart in regards to what was going on with Russian Jehovah's Witnesses, maybe writing and sending hundreds if not thousands of letters to the leadership in New York or other branches around the world, it would get them to take a look in the mirror. If only for the sake of people having that basic human right and being able to choose that they no longer want to worship in the form of, of Watchtower and Watchtower Doctrine. Thank you so much for the work you do, and have a great day. Thank you very much for that message, and I really appreciate the kind words uh, about my work. Well, that's a very interesting idea that you have. It, it's not the first time I've heard people say, why don't we do um, a letter writing campaign? And I think it's... I'm always um, filled with admiration when people take the initiative in that direction and try to think of ways that they can make a difference. I guess I'm open to doing that kind of thing, but only on condition that I genuinely believe that there is something that can be achieved. So, for example, um, if there was, let's say there was a government body in the United States that had the possibility of um, investigating Jehovah's Witnesses or there was some possibility of getting Watchtower's uh, tax exemption removed by doing that kind of letter writing campaign, I would definitely be interested in urging my viewers uh, and subscribers to, to write letters and helping them to do that and giving them addresses and that kind of thing. And that may well be something that happens in the future, but I... I don't quite see how it would be productive if we were to uh, letter bomb uh, Watchtower, uh, the headquarters, or, or anywhere else, because they, th these letters, which people would have gone to uh, a great deal of time to 
you know, write them and mail them and, and that kind of thing. And I'm guessing it would be quite emotional in, in some cases for people to do this. I can just imagine them just being destroyed when they're received at headquarters. And I think that people's time is valuable. And I wouldn't want to encourage people to do something that I don't think would make a huge deal of difference just for the sake of keeping them busy, basically. I, I think that our time on this planet is precious and I want us to make the most of it. But having said that, I think there's merit in your idea and I think that it, it's just a matter of finding the right way. We, it's like we have this weapon at our disposal of mobilising this large group of people. I just want the target to be worthy of it, if that makes sense. So once we have um, an initiative that um, is lined up and it, it, the, there is a, a good chance that it will make a difference, by all means I will use this channel to do a letter writing campaign. I've tried to do similar things when it comes to it, urging child abuse victims to come forward and speak to the Guardian and that kind of thing. But obviously what you're talking about is anyone basically to, uh, to write in and to, to take that kind of action. And again, if I can find a worthy way of, of utilising this tool, I'm very interested in pursuing that kind of strategy. So thank you for your suggestion. Italian Vapor says, Do you think that if religions that allowed shunning lost their tax status, that this might work? It's dicey in the United States because of separation of church and state. Italian Vapor, I don't think that any organisation, religious or otherwise, that, um, that separates families, that encourages people to shun other human beings in pursuit of their agenda, should be tax exempt. I think that we're then talking about cults. I can see why uh, there needs to be um, some way for religious organisations that do genuine charity work and when I say genuine charity work I mean with no strings attached so they're just doing it, it you have say a church that's providing free meals or just doing something in their community without expecting people to to join that uh, movement or join that church there needs to be a way of organisations that are religious to do that um, without being taxed. But I don't think that just because you're a religion, <laughs> you deserve to be tax exempt. In fact, I think that the opposite is true. I think that if you are essentially um, promoting a religious idea, it's no different to me than just selling a product. You're selling a product that makes people uh, feel good or gives people some kind of hope. Um, I don't see why you should be able to do that without paying any taxes. Charitable work is different, but when it comes to just the idea of being uh, a religion, um, I don't quite understand why religions need to be tax exempt. And yes, if there was the penalty of losing tax exemption, specifically in the case of mandated shunning, I can see that would be an incentive for organisations to rethink their policies. Uh, because bottom line, organisations like Watchtower don't want to get penalised and they don't want to have to pay money, although they seem quite happy to keep doling out money to support their child abuse policy when it comes to court fines and settlements and what have you. So it's quite possible that they would just interpret any remo removal of tax exemption as being persecution and uh, just ask their followers for more money. But it's um, a good point that you raise. Mike Spilligan01 says, Hi Lloyd, love your work. I'm an ardent atheist. As a group, we lean towards live and let live. Does this work against militant ideologies seeking to convert by any means? Do we need implacable, immovable faiths to act as a moat against radicals? I think if I understand your question correctly, 
you're asking whether there is some merit in just um, in not criticizing religion so long as it's not radical because then at least you're kind of providing some kind of buffer for people who feel the need to be religious so that they don't join a radical organization. I don't quite see it that way. I think that um, all bad ideas, even if they are relatively benign and don't lead to people, for example, becoming suicide bombers, if it's a bad idea and it doesn't make logical sense, then you should be able to criticize it. Not only should you be able to criticize it, but you ought to criticize it or someone ought to criticize it. And I think that doing the opposite and saying, oh, well, we really ought not to criticize um, religious ideas. We ought to live and let live. Well, <laughs> I am happy to let anyone live who is religious. It's not really about stamping out their rights or, um, or imposing my beliefs on them, which is what religions have done um, in centuries past. It's more about starting a conversation and letting people reach their own conclusions. And the danger you have if you say, oh, well, we need to protect religious ideas and not have anyone criticize them, the danger you have is that you're then making it possible for more radical, more extreme versions of religion to exist because you are basically saying to people, there's, there's a limit in what we can talk about. There's a limit in what we're allowed to criticise. And if you're, if you're going to um, apply this to moderate religious ideas, you also really need to apply it to ideas that can very easily and quickly lead to uh, more radical, um, more extremist religious ideology. So I think that so long as it's done with respect so long as it's done calmly and with, with logic and in a reasonable, non-sensationalist way, I think all ideas are fair game when it comes to applying logic and reason. And I think that the minute we start to insulate ideas from criticism, especially religious ones, we're basically holding the door open for the more radical, more extreme versions of religion to prosper. Cozy Life says, Hi Lloyd, I'm really intrigued with these strange pictures that keep being found within JW publications. I know you don't believe Watchtower are trying to subliminally affect their audience, but what do you believe these images are all about? So I haven't um, spoken too much about subliminal, subliminal images because I quite frankly don't think there is anything to talk about. It's true that when you look in Watchtower publications, as is gonna be the case with an organization that publishes a heck of a lot of material, much of which is, is hand-drawn or hand-painted by humans who are you know, capable of of basically being bad artists or, or drawing things in a in an awful way. There are gonna be things, there are gonna be pictures that don't make sense or that could be construed as looking like something completely different, or in some cases things that are very rude, as is the case with the uh, 2000, I think it's a 2009 songbook on the back, had, um, had something that looked very much like a, a male member on the back cover. Um, look, when you have artists, artists don't, artists can make mistakes. Artists can just do bad art that can be construed as looking like anything. Um, when it comes to subliminal imagery, in order to be subliminal imagery, it, you can't be able to notice it. So if something looks like, for example, a male member, then by definition it's not subliminal imagery because you can see what it looks like. So uh, <laughs> I think that a lot of people who talk about subliminal imagery probably don't understand what subliminal means. Because if you can detect it and you can say, oh, well, this looks like this, therefore I'm being manipulated, then it stops being subliminal, it, it starts being overt. And quite frankly, Watchtower 
is, um, is capable enough of influencing people overtly through its written message without having to dabble in anything like that. So I think that when you see anomalies in Watchtower artwork, it's just purely a case of bad art. At, at the very worst, it could be an artist having a bit of a joke but I don't think it's anything where the governing body have sat down and said, we absolutely need to have a male member on the back of the songbook. <laughs> I think it's purely um, a, either a coincidence or an accident. Ruby on Twitter asks, why does counting time and placing books such an importance for their salvation? Shouldn't their relationship with God be more important? Ruby, if I understand your question, Correctly, I agree with what you're saying, that when you are a Jehovah's Witness, there's an enormous focus on, on works. So in other words, with Christianity, a lot of Christian denominations put the focus on faith and on grace. Um, but with Jehovah's Witnesses, it's all about works. They use the scripture in James about faith without works is dead. And they, they use this to tell witnesses that unless they're doing demonstrable works by placing literature and, and doing a number of hours in the preaching work, then their faith is, is meaningless. And of course, that kind of reasoning can be hijacked by any group to manipulate people into doing all manner of things. So yes, it is uh, a strange aspect of the witness faith and something where, quite frankly, even as a witness, I wasn't altogether comfortable with how much focus there was on counting time and, and that kind of thing. Hal E says, Hey Lloyd, I have a question for the next Ask Cedars video. How would you deal with the hypothetical situation that your father was still in your life despite you leaving, and therefore was in your daughter's life, and on visits with him, he asked to be allowed, read my book of Bible stories to your daughter, asking your permission first, and saying that he would only read the stories you approved of. I ask this question because for myself and a few of my friends who are in the process of fading, we still have family that are witnesses and coming to realise our positions and do still want relationships with us. And for my parents, they have asked if they could read my children my book of Bible stories that I approved of and have even wanted to take my son to the Sunday meeting after he spent the night. So far, I've avoided the meeting issue by just not packing clothes, but I've not really dealt with the other question. I don't want my children to be influenced by witness teachings and at the same time because my parents have been open-minded with me I feel some need to compromise with them. Um, Hal, I'm frankly mortified <laughs> by your hypothetical scenario. I can understand that this is a genuine dilemma for some but for me personally there is absolutely no way in the world that I would agree to cult propaganda being shown to my young child in any way, shape or form, whether it's Caleb and Sophia cartoons, my book of Bible stories, which by the way is one of the most disturbing books <laughs> that you could choose to thrust in a child's face. There's a more recent version of that book which isn't as grotesque in its artwork, but I, um, I think that some of the artwork in my book of Bible stories has no place being shown to uh, to young children in particular because it's very gory and very frightening. Um, so there's absolutely no way. I mean, e even if it was the toned down version, so the more recent version of my book of Bible stories, there is no way I would let an indoctrinated family member try and thrust their indoctrination on my child. It's just not going to happen. Um, I don't see why I would need to compromise on that. If they want to have, if any of my um, JW family members want to have my daughter in their life, um, then they're, they're very welcome to come round. We'll make them a coffee, we'll make them a meal, we'll have a nice conversation. 
Uh, but I, I think most likely religion would need to be kept out of it. I'm willing to talk about religion with them, but I suspect they wouldn't want to hear my views. In other words, with Jehovah's Witnesses, it's a one-way street. <laughs> they're only willing to talk about religion if they're the ones doing the talking and if they're the ones doing the teaching. And it's, it's one thing to have that scenario when you're adults. It's another thing entirely when children are involved and adults are basically trying to program a young person's mind with their indoctrination. Ain't going to happen, I'm afraid. Especially, as you say there, taking them to a Sunday meeting. No way. No way in the world. I can imagine going to a meeting with Jessica uh, one day when she's a bit older. I know Paul Grundy's done this with uh, Zach. Just to kind of say, this is what, this is how I was raised, and this is what you would have had to go through twice a week if I had raised you as a Jehovah's Witness. I think that's an interesting exercise, <clears throat> but that would have to be when Jessica is much older, and it certainly wouldn't be a case of, well, we need to take this seriously, we need to uh, apply what's being said. It would be more like a, like an experiment almost to show her. This is the uh, tradition that we escaped from in order to give you the freedom to think for yourself. Emmanuel Carmo 1 says, Hi Cedars, have you ever considered the possibility of someone believing on a higher being without being under the control of a religion or cult? So, just for the record Emmanuel, I've said before I'm perfectly fine I'd, I'm, I'm not going to lose any sleep if um, it turns out that even a majority of my viewers are religious. I don't think that's the case, but it, basically it doesn't make any difference to me whether you watching this um, are religious or not. Um, I just feel as though when I'm making my videos and I'm, talk, I'm talking about religion, I need to have the freedom on my own channel to express my views, which happen to be atheist, on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. And obviously anyone can comment, and if I've said something that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, you're free to, um, to express that, and you're free to challenge me on that. But I don't insist that everyone who watches my videos should, should join me in my atheism. In fact, I think it would be silly to expect that. Even though I like to present atheism as at least an option for those who are fleeing cults. In other words, I, I say you can, if you want to, leave religion altogether. I actually think that it's unrealistic to expect there to be, for example, a world that's free of religion. I think that, um, that there will always be people who find consolation in religious ideas. The only, the only thing that, that disturbs me when it comes to any form of religion, because obviously you have harmful religions and, and you have less harmful religions, or religions that are, it's hard to find <laughs> where the harm is when you examine their practices. For example, you could have a church that says, you can just come and go as you please, we're not gonna shun you if you stop attending, we're not going to shun you if you stand up and disagree with us. It's all completely laid back. You could have that kind of church. But even so, if you are teaching things that aren't true or don't make sense, it's one thing to, to receive that information and nod along with that information as an adult. It's another thing entirely to, as you know, referring to my previous question that I answered, it's another thing entirely to program a child to think that way, to indoctrinate them with things that can't be proven. I think that is harmful, quite frankly, um, so that even if everything else about the religion is perfectly benign, I think just the simple act of programming a child to believe things that can't be proven, uh, that alone is, is harmful. Is that a cult? I would suggest and have suggested in my book that you could in fact call that a soft cult. 
So if the only issue with your religion is that, that you're teaching things that can't be proven, I would personally call that a soft cult. But I don't think it can rightly be thought of as being anywhere near as bad as hard cults like Jehovah's Witnesses, like Scientology, like fundamentalist um, Islam. So yes, basically I'm quite happy for people to believe what they want. We all have that right, it's a human right to freedom of conscience, but I think we just need to be wary when it comes to children and when it comes to the next generation and giving them the best possible start in life. And I can't see it being beneficial to teach children to believe things as fact when it's just ideas that provide us with consolation. I hope that makes sense. And now it's down to, we're down to our final question, which comes in the form of a voicemail. Hello, Lloyd. Great work from you and your team, and a big thank you from me. My question involves the supplies of leaked information, and this is the question. Do they ever explain their motivation for this activity? That's a good question. Uh, so do the people who contact us with leaked information ever tell us why they're doing it? And I guess the answer is yes. So they don't just email us a file or a link to a file and that's all they have to say. They do quite often introduce themselves and say, well, here's, you know, I have to, I have to keep my identity secret. I have to keep some of the details of who I am secret because I can't risk being found out. But I appreciate the work that you guys are doing. I have my own issues with regards to X, Y, Z and I want to help you out to the extent possible by providing you with information. So that's the sort of email that we will receive when we're receiving a new leak or when we're being contacted by a new uh, leaker. Obviously we can't share that information and we would never share it because then we're again jeopardizing the, um, the privacy or the, the, the we're, we're making things more difficult, put it that way. But yes, we do get some information from leakers as to what's motivating them and uh, all I have to say in, in addition to that is that these are very brave individuals who we all owe a great deal to because um, especially with some of the recent leaks I mean just being able to know what's going to be said at the convention months in advance is a huge help with the kind of work that we're doing and it really is helping to um, explain to people how they're being lied to and helping people to break free from their indoctrination, which can have a profound impact on, the, on not just their lives, but also the lives of perhaps their children or their grandchildren. So this all has a profound effect. And I am always extremely grateful and appreciative to the very brave individuals inside Watchtower who leak us information. So I'm afraid that's all I've got time for. If you want me to consider your question for the next Ask Cedars episode, all you need to do is tweet to me using the hashtag Ask Cedars, or you can just drop it in a comment below this video, or I absolutely love it when I can receive the questions by voicemail, and the address for that is speakpipe.com forward slash cedars. But I, that's all I've got time for. I hope you found some of these questions and answers interesting. And as always, thank you for watching.